We ready, everyone? Thank you. Welcome to this meeting of the Gambling, Licensing and Regulatory Committee. Uh, first item is apologies. I've got apologies from Councillors Mercer, Mason, Callum Taylor. I understand that Councillor Wells might be coming late, but if she doesn't turn up, then can we record her apologies as well? Councillor Colwick, I think he's still on holiday. Colwick as well, please. Okay. Uh, declarations of interest. Has anyone got any additional declarations of interest? Nope. Okay, we'll move on to public participation. I understand we have one member of the public who wishes to speak. Okay, apologies, I haven't, I haven't received it. I just said a very simple point. That's fine, so if you want to join us at the table, um, I'll give you, you, you have three minutes, I'll give you a warning with 30 seconds remaining. If you can turn your microphone on as well, that would be uh, brilliant. It's just a button in the middle. Plus, minus, and mic. Mike. The, the mic one. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name's Saf, Safdin. I'm a Hackney carriage driver. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. I welcome Council's uh, proposals in terms of what we had recently, um, Euro Emission 6 vehicles coming in and upgrading of that. Uh, I just wanted to highlight it again that we're really struggling to get new vehicles, particularly since 2016, that are not... Uh, coming with tinted windows. It is proving to be a, a big factor now when you want to change to Euro Emission 6 and upgrade your vehicle. Uh, if City of York Council is really looking for a, a better fleet uh, and uh, more environmentally friendly, then I think that policy needs to be just reviewed again. Adjoining authorities, uh, I have some data on this. Uh, adjoining authorities actually do allow blacked out windows. They're not blacked out, but the factory tinted windows, uh, Harrogate, Malton, um, Hambleton, Selby, Leeds, and further you, further afield you go. Um, so I think York, you know, unless we've got some major problem that I'm not aware of, I would really appreciate it, and so would the trade, if you could just review the tinted windows policy. Um, I'm looking to change my E-Class Mercedes for a newer one, and anything 2016 upwards, uh, it's all coming with factory fin fitted, tinted, and doesn't meet the current criteria, which is 70%, I believe. Um, so they're not blacked out, but the factory fitted tinted are not good enough. Uh, so really, it's just that simple point. I'd really appreciate it if you can just look at it again. Thank you very Thank much you. for your comments. They, were, they will be taken into account when we discuss Any questions? the later item. We don't do questions at this bit, unfortunately, but, but thank you. Okay, so moving on to... Item three, taxi licensing policy, proposed amendments. Leslie, I believe you're going to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. This report seeks members' approval to formally consult on a proposed amendments to the taxi licensing policy. As a number of members of this committee will be aware, we introduced the current policy. Um, it was approved by this committee in April um, 2016, and it received full approval by the Council's Executive in January 2017, and the full policy is available at Annex 1 of the report. Um, as members are also aware, we've been doing some joint work with the West Yorkshire authorities as part of the combined authority. And this work has, was done as a request from Council leaders following the outcome of the Jay and Casey reports and that the six authorities harmonise some of our policies in relation to hackney carriage and private hire licensing. The, um, the group of officers have worked in conjunction with and have reported to a group that's been made up of licensing committee chairs. It was agreed that the areas that we needed to look at and to address dealt with issues such as cross-border enforcement, training for new driver applicants and licensed drivers, determining the suitability of applicants and licensed drivers in relation to convictions, CCTV and licensed vehicles, vehicle, spec vehicle specification and information sharing between authorities. Due to the introduction of the Deregulation Act, officers firstly looked at the cross-border enforcement as members of this committee will be aware, we brought a report to this committee on the 11th of J July 2016 to support an amendment to our delegation scheme so that we could um, give the other West Yorkshire authorities enforcement powers to take action against our vehicles in their area. 
and other authorities did the same so we can take enforcement action against their licensed vehicles and drivers in our area. That, that cross-border enforcement is now in force and all authorities apply that enforcement procedure. Officers have looked at the training that each authority expects a new driver applicant to complete prior to a licence being issued and refresher training that licensed drivers should complete. It was agreed that training requirements should be the same across each authority and the proposed training policy can be found at Annex 2 of the report. It is a requirement that a driver applicant and licensed drivers are, remain are fit and proper persons to hold a licence. Therefore, each authority looked at how we judge the suitability of applicants and licensed drivers in relation to any convictions they may hold prior to being licensed or receive once they are licensed. It was agreed, that, again, that the fit and proper person test should be the same for each authority and that we... Uh, that we propose a, a conviction policy across all of the six, of six authorities. And again, that policy can be found at Annex 3. The proposed policy at Annex 3 has been done in line with um, guidance that was produced by the Institute of Licensing in partnership with various other bodies, the, the Local Government Association, lawyers in local government and they, they published their guidance April of this year and um, that's been a real help with regards to um, producing our own conviction policy for want of a better term and thankfully a lot of other authorities across the country are also applying that guidance that's been issued by the Institute of Licensing. During the course of this project, um, the National Anti-Fraud Network has produced a register for taxi and private hire drivers, driver refusals and revocations. This has been very good because this helps us share information across the country where previously we hadn't been able to do that. We're registered with NAFN and so are the, other, the five West Yorkshire authorities. And that means if we refuse to license somebody in York, we can put that information on this database. Or if we revoke somebody's license, we can put some information on that database. We are restricted by data protection, so we can't give the grounds of why we've revoked somebody's license. But that triggers another authority to think, York's revoked this person, why will ring York? and we would do the same. We'd look on this register and ring the other authority area. So that's aided us in the helping of the sharing of information. And because it's a national thing, it's not just the six authorities that are sharing information then, it's nationally that that information can be shared. Due to the differences between the authorities with regards to vehicle specification, it was determined that we should look at this a lot further because there are so many differences. And that is one of the areas that we couldn't get a, an agreement on. So as a, as a combined authority, we're going to get the two proposals through that we've bought, come before you today for consultation. And we'll look at vehicle specification moving forward. We've also had the same situation with regarding CCTV in licensed vehicles. Um, due to the requirements of the information commissioner, each we, we've got to look at that a lot more closely as well because you've got to meet the information commissioner's requirements and that is not an easy challenge with regards to recording people in what could be classed as a private vehicle and when you get into voice recording you've also reached another level that you've got to meet the requirements of the information commissioner. As we've, we were, we're, look, we're asking this authority if we can go out for consultation on two areas of new policy through the West Yorkshire Group, we also decided it, it was a good time to look at some of the areas where we have issues with our vehicle specification. So we also propose within the consultation to include the fact of some areas where we would like to align our policies with some of the West Yorkshire authorities and um, update a couple of our current vehicle specifications. One of the, the two new air things that we would like to introduce, we want to introduce a window disc. The, this 
four of the other the West Yorkshire authorities have a window disc and it's basically like having your tax disc in your car and the reason why I think that's a good move forward is the fact of if a West Yorkshire authority for saying sake inspected a vehicle at the side of the road and determined it wasn't fit to be licensed it, its wheel tread wasn't correct they suspend that vehicle at that time and they remove the window disc so other enforcement officers are aware that that vehicle should not be operating as either a hackney carriage or a private hire and i think that's a good move forward that we we bring that policy in with regards to this authority we'd also like to introduce a set color for our hackney carriage vehicles of black now a majority of you may think that our hackney carriage fleet is black and the majority of it is but it's, that's our preference colour, but we would like to bring in a standard policy that the fleet is black. In fact, it makes the vehicles stand out, easily recognisable as a York vehicle, with our crest on the doors, the taxi light on the top, etc., to make it, our vehicles stand out more, and it makes the fleet look nicer, for want of a better term. Um, one of the things that we have issues with with our um, licensed vehicles is where they display their license plate um, they stick it in windows various different locations on the vehicle we want to be very clear where the plate has to be located on the vehicle so it makes that vehicle easily identifiable and somebody isn't suddenly thinking is that a plate that's in that window on the slant that i can't read properly or clearly see um, and again, with door signage, people have a tendency to locate door signage in different locations on the door. We want to be specific that it has to be centrally located. We're also looking at removing a couple of our current um, requirements. Engine size, minimum engine size. We're encouraging people to have greener vehicles. We're encouraging people to have fully electric vehicles. Therefore, those type of vehicles don't have a minimum engine size. So do we really need a policy condition that says that they do? And we currently ask all our vehicles to have an internal plate. And if, if Mr. Din could sit and speak at the table again, he would tell you that the phone number on the internal plates is out of date. But my, I don't foresee that we need that internal plate anymore if we're going to have a nicely displayed disc in the window that on both sides gives the information about that licensed vehicle. So the, the options, so we were looking at going out for an eight week consultation. All six authorities will do the consultation at exactly the same time. Um, with regards to the consultation running between November and December, we may extend the consultation a little bit more than eight weeks to take into consideration of the Christmas and New Year period. And of course, the outcome of the consultation will be brought before this committee. So the options before you today are authorise officers to consult on the proposed amendments to the taxi licensing policy and agree the consultation period for eight weeks. Authorise officers to come to consult and propose amendments to the taxi licensing policy and agree an alternative consultation period. Authorise officers to consult an alternative amended to the taxi licensing policy and agree a consultation period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. I'll start with questions to okay. Leslie. Um. It was just a question uh, following on the, uh, the speaker. Um, I didn't realise that we didn't allow um, tinted windows. And if it's now more difficult to buy, purchase a new vehicle that doesn't meet our specifications, do we want to be looking at it? I'm, I, I haven't a view either way, but it just seems... Um, we're not talking about blacked-out windows. We're talking about, presumably, tinted windows that come as standard when you buy a car. I think mine must have them, but you, you'd hardly know... I think a clarification of what our policy is, first yeah. of all, would probably be helpful. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, when we updated our policy, introduced this taxi licensing policy um, in 2016, we did a full consultation on the policy at that time. And due to the comments that we received, so we did receive some comments at that time regarding the window tint, yeah. we did amend the policy with the fact that um, the windows at the front, be it the windscreen and the windows at either side of the driver are a standard requirement across the entire country. Every vehicle has to meet those requirements. With regards to the windows behind the driver, we amended our, because our previous policy had been 70%, and we amended that and reduced it to 50%. So we did at that time take into consideration um, comments received as part of that consultation. We, as a the committee determined that they didn't want to bring in a policy where any tint could apply because of the fact they saw it as a public safety issue of being, people being able to see inside the vehicle when passengers are in the vehicle. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that, 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 that that's right. I, it was only whether it's worth us re, or officers revisiting this to see whether it's going to cause a problem in the future. Perhaps not necessarily as part of this consultation. That was all. Yeah. That's one of the things when we've been discussing it as a West Yorkshire yeah. group, that's one of the things that out of the six authorities we need to discuss a lot further because some authorities are very adamant that their <coughs> policy is correct and shouldn't change where other authorities are more open to negotiation. Yeah, I'm happy with that. If it's going to be part of the, your discussions, that's great. I just think, having had it raised, you know, with things changing that are out of our control and out of the driver's control, we need to make sure that we're as up to date as we can be. Councillor Pavlovich. Thank you. I was, I was just going to reinforce the, the, the point Councillor Reid's just made um, about... We, we want to try to bring in consistency and if some authorities um, are acknowledging that there's a tinting window issue when you're buying a new car, um, then we don't want to be making life more complicated for drivers trying to um, update and, and, and replace their vehicles. And it's just on that question that um, you've put um, a time scale of June um, 2019 for the replacement of vehicles, hackney carriage vehicles, to black. Um, is that too short a period if, if somebody has just recently replaced their vehicle? Um, would, would 18 months or something be, be more appropriate, or is that something that's bringing us in line with, with other authorities? The reason for bringing in the June date is all our vehicles, Hackney Carriage vehicles, are licensed from that date. Mm. And it won't mean that by that date, if you've got a red Hackney Carriage, you're going to have to change it to black. It will be then when you next do a change of vehicle beyond that date. So if you don't do a change of vehicle for three years hence, you don't have to bring in a black vehicle until that three years time when you do a change of vehicle. Councillor Boyce, quickly. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess that if there's issues when people are changing the vehicles that Seth brought up about the tinting of the windows, that would affect vehicles being purchased in all the local authorities anyway, won't it? So if we're, if we're having joint policies with other authorities, the same issues would affect them. And so it would need to be brought in across the, across the board. Yeah, that's correct. It, it, it is. It's affect. It'll mm. affect every authority. If there's certain vehicles that you can't get a vehicle mm. now unless it's got a specific tint, it won't just be in York. But you have that issue. Yeah. Councillor Douglas. Thank you. Um, this disc. I'm interested in how big the disc is going to be. It's sort of like the size of that small. That's very small. A disc is round, isn't it? Not rectangular, but. Oh, sorry. It will, be, it will be a similar card to our ID cards. We haven't mocked one up as yet because 
I aren't doing that until we've got the policy in. But we will. It will be something that is clearly seen that you can read the information from both inside and outside of the vehicle. So it could probably be a bit bigger than these, but it'll be along these lines. It'll be a plastic, proper plastic card like these particular cards. If I was sitting behind in the, in, on the back, I wouldn't be able to see that, even if it was in the corner of the windscreen in front. So we'll talk about that during discussion then. Any further questions? I've got uh, one relating to the English, uh, English test. Um, it's something that I raised in the, in the chair's meeting, but I can fully appreciate the, the, the need for, for an English language test. One of the, I suppose, concerns that I have is that it might be unnecessary if someone has, an, for example, a, a GCSE in English to force them to go through an English test. And I just wonder whether there are any exemptions that could be put in as part of that policy or perhaps as uh, through this consultation process. Um, maybe we could look again at that. just wonder what your thoughts were. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll see what the outcome of the consultation is because, of course, the consultation, we're talking a lot of drivers and that are going to be consulted on this matter across the six authority areas. So it, I think it probably could potentially be something that is picked up through part of the consultation and we, we will have to address at that time of how we move that forward. Sorry, and I know we're going to be talking about DBS more in the next agenda, actually, <coughs> but just to, just to clarify with you, um, the policy that we're proposing within this licensing is consistent throughout the West Yorkshire Combined Authority area um, in respect of DBS and the requirements for drivers to a, have them initially and then to have them renewed on a, on a regular basis. The convictions policy that's within the documentation is to deal with the fact of, yes, every driver applicant has a, has a disclosure and barring service check, and then through the, the life of their licence, they proceed to have further ones. And the, it's a, the joint policy is if any convictions are identified on that check, how we deal with those convictions, whether we determine that the licence, that the, the applicant or the driver the applicant shouldn't be licensed or the driver shouldn't remain licensed because we don't believe with that conviction they're fit and proper to do so. Just on that, just on that point, it mentions in, in the report serious offences or serious convictions. Um, do you have a, 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 a determination of, a, as to what constitutes a serious offence? Um, a driving matter might be a serious offence if you're going to be a taxi driver or um, an alcohol related offence might be a serious matter if you're licensed for a ta as a taxi driver wouldn't necessarily be considered to be a serious offence in other forums. I feel like there's a table somewhere isn't yeah. there? If you, it, within the policy um, the draft policy, which starts on page 79, um, on page 85, there is a table um, with regards to the type of offences and um, the time periods that it are deemed that if that's lapsed, that a licence could be granted. But each each case will be considered on its own merits as well, because even if you even if, if somebody had a conviction. Um, for saying offensive violence and the 10 years as had lapsed you would still sit down and talk to that applicant about said offence and you could still determine that they're not fit and proper to, to be licensed the fact that we've in a, in a policy document we've said 10 years doesn't necessarily mean that you would definitely get licensed because you would still talk to that applicant about that offence and the, the reasons behind that offence um, just to give you an example, um, earlier this year, I revoked a driver's licence because they had 13 penalty points on their driving right. licence. And I deemed that to be, you're a, you're, you're a driver for a living, therefore you're a professional driver. Mm -hmm. Getting 13 points on your driving licence does not say to me, you're a professional driver and therefore fit and proper. Um, 
that that particular applicant driver didn't license driver didn't like my decision because they determined that the court let them keep their driving license because of the exceptional hardship case but i that didn't come into the situation with me to me you're a professional driver and you should not have 13 points on your driving license to do that particular role i'll move it on to discussion um does anyone want to kick us off okay. councillor douglas so, yeah. microphone okay. back to the disc i know it sounds i'm being persistent but all i can see in my head is the sort of size of the tax disc and um you, you wouldn't be able to really read the, the text on that from the back. And also, will the, the disc be in Braille? Like some of it's currently the, the signs that are on the dashboards, have they do have a Braille on them, don't they? Well, will they be in Braille then, please, mm -hmm. so that blind people can feel them, even if they can't see them? The purpose of the disc will be, because the internal plate we currently have, I don't, is that size, if maybe not even quite this size, and all it does is give the taxi the vehicle's yeah. license number. Yeah. It doesn't give any more information than that. So the new disc that we will have will give a little bit more information. But if it's small, it doesn't matter what, you won't be able to see it. That's the point. That's why I want to know what size the disc will be. Will we it haven't, be this big or this big? We or? haven't determined what size right. the disc will be. That will be something that we, if we're going to introduce it, we'll be determine it then, because of, of okay. how much information we want to put on it. Yeah, well, we'll that's determine it. We'll the size. But we also don't, because it will be positioned in the windscreen, we also don't want it to block the view of the driver in any way. Yeah, I'm talking about the, the people in the car, in the back seat of the car being able to see it, not the parking attendants. Councillor Boyce. Would that disc be renewable every year then? It, it, would, it would last for a year and then as they, got, they renewed their licence it would be replaced? That's what we intend to do, yeah. It will have an expiry date on so that people will be aware if it's the, the expiry date is the 1st of June and it's the 2nd of June and it's still got yesterday's date on that that vehicle license has expired yeah yeah my own view on that is I think it's, it's particularly positive because it'll pr provide certainty for taxi users if the vehicle has been been suspended um, and also makes it you know, much more clear um, for for particularly in, in regards to cross-border enforcement as well in that we'll be able to physically remove uh, that window disc so I think that's that's particularly welcome um, in addition to that, I think also the proposals on the, the colour of hackneys uh, is a welcome move because you know, we, we've had many discussions about applying for hire, um, differentiating hackneys between, uh, from, from the private hire fleet, I think, particularly for members of the public, would be, would be a welcome move. Um, the only additional comment that I, I wish to make is I, I would have liked to have seen a, a joined up approach on, on the vehicle specifications. Mm -hmm. I understand obviously it's, a, it's very complicated and as you say Leslie, the different authorities are in very different places so the approach that we're taking at the moment to get what we do have agreement on through I think is the right one. Um, but particularly moving forward I think one thing that would be very helpful if we were able to achieve it in the future would be um, an agreement on how we test the vehicles. Um, because, uh, uh, and as, as you know, obviously different authorities do that in different ways, but ensuring that those vehicles are safe and that the, all of the fleet are safe for the travelling public is, is incredibly important. Uh, any further comments from members? Okay. Can, just... Can we have yellow like New York? <laughs> Microphone is me now. Um, obviously, we're remembering here that we're approving this for consultation as well. Um, so it's not that, that we are deciding and approving this. Uh, with that said, I'll, I'll propose option one, which is to authorise officers to consult on the proposed amendments to the taxi licensing policy and agree the consultation period of eight weeks, subject to the comments that you made earlier, Leslie, about potentially extending that over the, the Christmas period. Seconded by Councillor Pavlovich. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. I'll take that as unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. Okay, uh, invite Matt and, and Mike to the table as we move on to item four, which is the update on the taxi licensing internal audit report. Matt, I think you're going to. Thank you, Chair. Matt's going to talk through the 
take the members through the report. Yes, thank you, Chair. Councillors, this report updates you on the recent taxi licensing internal audit report, uh, which was discussed at audience, uh, Audit and Governance last month. Um, members are being asked uh, to consider the report, noting the particular progress made on the DBS checks, and uh, you're, being invite, you're being invited to in, invite officers uh, to consider whether the handful of drivers who have not engaged in the process continue to be considered fit and proper persons. By way of background, um, an internal audit was carried out at the request of the Director of Economy in Place Senior Management Team um, and the purpose of the audit is to provide support to management. The Council publicly reports the results of our audits, whether these are good, bad or indifferent, in the spirit of transparency, and, and I don't, that, that's a good thing, I, I, I don't suggest anything other than that. Uh, but you will see how we're operating, warts and all. And um, I, I respectfully ask that uh, the report is taken in, in, that, uh, in that spirit. I'm, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the DBS checks, because that's obviously the thing that, that attracts the headlines. Um, but the audit did consider other aspects in addition to the, the, the DBS check, which I'll touch upon. But it's the, the DBS checks that I'm going to spend most of uh, these next few minutes um, updating you on. So to, to start with, the, f the, first, the first point to, to make, to put this in context, is that, whether you believe it or not, DBS checks are best practice. There is no legal obligation to undertake them, either at the beginning of the application or on an ongoing basis. However, of course, um, I obviously don't seek to say anything other than that they are important. Um, they are important for public safety, and our, our licensing policy states that they will be carried out for new drivers, and then on an ongoing basis every three years. Now. It's important to stress that all drivers have been DBS checked before being granted a first licence. I want to stress that so much, I'm actually going to say it again. All drivers have been DBS checked before being granted a first licence. It's the ongoing refresher checks which are, which are an issue. And these checks are a backstop to a number of other activities which take place to determine whether drivers continue to be fit and proper persons throughout the term of their licence. And, and these other activities that we engage in are vital because they provide the here and now, what's going on right now, whereas DBS checks are a backward looking check because they're carried out every, every few years. So for example, as part of these other activities, drivers are required by law to notify licensing officers if they're arrested and or charged with any offences, and they make a self-declaration of any notifiable offences upon renewal of a licence. But of course, it's fairly obvious that there are potential weaknesses in a system of self-reporting. So with that in mind, officers have excellent lines of communication with the police who inform us upon arrest of a licensed person for any serious crime they're investigating under their common law powers of disclosure. And this can and does result in suspensions and revocations of licences. We've actually seen licences being revoked as a result of the police referring matters through to us. And other partners and council services also report their concerns through to taxi licensing officers and again that does and has resulted in licenses being revoked. Operators themselves can report complaints about their drivers and we investigate complaints from other drivers and members of the public. All of these things again do result in sanctions and there was actually a report to the executive uh, last week which described the enforcement activity that's been taken by officers uh, in relation to uh, taxi matters. And again, I want to stress that the number of complaints and issues of concern are really small in comparison to the number of taxi journeys that take place uh, each year in this city. It's also worthy of note that all drivers carrying school children uh, under school contracts have had regular ongoing refresher checks as required under, their, uh, under the terms of those contracts. So, to come back to the point, 
It's the refresher checks which haven't been carried out routinely as they should have been. So since the 16th of July, officers have been working hard to rectify the situation. And thankfully, the overwhelming majority of drivers have embraced this. They fully cooperated with us to get the checks done and we're very grateful for that support and cooperation that we've been given. As of nine o'clock this morning, 685 of the 149 uh, drivers were, 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 have become due a check. And of these, 477 checks, at 70%, have now been completed. 47 drivers, that's 7%, are surrendering their licence, in the process of surrendering the licence. I want to stress that's not because they think that they're going to, the DBS check is going to throw something up, that's because they don't want to spend the money on, on a DBS check because they're no longer driving. So they're, they're, they're surrendering their licence. And uh, 117 drivers are at various stages in the process. So uh, they begin the process um, and, and the uh, paperwork, or, or yeah, it's electronic now, so the, 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 the application gets submitted to um, the DBS uh, checkers. And so there's 117 in that process, out of our control, out of the driver's control, we're waiting for DBS to, 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 uh, to complete their checks. This leaves uh, 44 drivers, just 6%, who are being chased, and they're being chased further as they're not engaging. Now, it may be that they've left the trade and um, um, that they're, therefore they're, they're, they're just not, not taking the calls, ignoring the letters, and I think that probably accounts for many of them. However, there are a very small minority who are stubbornly not participating in the process, unfortunately. And, and therefore, um, officers would like to consider these people who are stubbornly not engaging, uh, we'd like to consider them not fit and proper people uh, to continue as taxi drivers, and we're seeking your support in, in respect of this. Okay, I'll just touch on a couple of the other things uh, in, the, in the audit report before I come back to um, uh, the next steps. And the proposal. Driver training, you're well versed on driver training. I don't propose to go through that uh, again. Uh, and the report was, was supported in that respect. Um, the audit report was also very positive in respect of recognising that officers are carrying out the myriad of checks before a licence is required. The audit was also positive in respect of enforcement. It recognises the significant additional pressure uh, that the team have been under in response to complaints about out-of-town drivers. That's those working here but are not licensed by the council. Uh, but we will take on board the recommendation that we look at the operator's um, records to ensure that all the complaints that are meant to be reporting through are being reported through. But as I say, we are receiving regular complaints from operators. So I don't anticipate being that an issue. But we will check as suggested. And then the last thing the audit considered was the restriction on the number of taxi license, uh, taxi vehicle, li hackney vehicle licences, and whether that's appropriate. And again, you dealt with that uh, at a committee recently and have agreed to um, uh, look at that in more detail late, later on. So that brings me back to the options. Uh, op option one is to note the report, particularly the progress made on DBS checks and to ask officers to consider whether the handful of drivers who haven't engaged in the process can continue to be considered fit and proper persons. The ultimate sanction for that, of course, being <coughs> that the drivers will have their licences suspended or revoked, depending on the circumstances, and each case would need to be considered on its merits. In the analysis, I've set out a little bit more detail about what this might look like in, in, in practice, so it says that um, any driver who hasn't completed the, the application process itself get the ball rolling, send, make their submission to the DBS. Uh, if they haven't completed that by the 31st of October, then officers may consider them not a fit and proper person. Then, as I've described, the, um, uh, the DBS carry out the checks and, and the driver receives the record back from the DBS. 
So what the next um, stage would be, if we haven't received back the paperwork and, and completed our part of that check on the paperwork, by the end of December, uh, they would be considered not a fit and proper person, or potentially. And this will enable us then to complete any checks with any um, adverse uh, hits that come back. That will enable us to complete all those checks and those hits. Are they hits that we already know about? Is it something new? And that would enable us to complete all of that by the end of March and comply with the um, timeline set down in the audit. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. I'll, I'll just start off by saying, obviously, this has gone to audit and governance already. Uh, I, I sit on audit and governance, as, as does uh, Councillor Mason, who's not here. So I, I feel like I've had my crack of the whip um, already, but I'm happy to, to provide some of the, the background in terms of how audit and governance committee uh, felt about it. Obviously, it's worth noting that they asked for it to be referred uh, to this committee. Um, one of the things that was discussed, and I think ultimately there are two issues here. The first issue is the audit itself uh, and how that's dealt with and responded to. And the second issue is what Matt finished up on there was about the, the license holders who are, are not engaging with the process. So I think it's important that those two are, are dealt with separately. The recommendation or potential recommendation that this committee might wish to uh, seek is one that I supported at Audit and Governance. And, I, and that is that the, this committee receives monitoring reports from officers about the number of um, licenses that effectively haven't, licensees who have not had their DBS checked um, every three years and have that as either a quarterly or a six monthly report just so that we can ensure that this issue is properly dealt with. So I'll, I'll start off with questions uh, to officers and Councillor Hunter was in there first. It's just a small one, actually. Just on this um, small minority that have refused, have any of those um, actually come back to you and said why they're refusing, or is it a question of the fact that you're not actually getting, you know, to those people either by the letters or emails? We've sent letters, I think it's three letters now, and one of the officers has been phoning daily uh, these, these people, and I've also made a number of uh, other inquiries to try and get the numbers. Um, it may be that some of these drivers have, have left the industry and, and, and haven't notified us. Um, the, pro the proposal we've outlined uh, would deal with that. Unfortunately, there are one or two that are just being really stubborn and are, are writing in um, and saying that um, they don't want to par partake in this process, which is unfortunate. But it is one or two um, that, that, are, that have gone to that length. I think it's just that I feel that if you've, it's this scenario, if you've got nothing to fear, then there's nothing, anything wrong to do with this DBS, because I've, I've had some of these checks done myself, and I think, you know, mm -hmm. you, sh you should just follow the rules and just have these checks done. The, the, I, had, I saw a flurry of hands at Matt. Do you want to the, the, the only other thing to put into the mix, there is a, there is a cost uh, to this for the driver. It's about £44, if, if I remember rightly. Um, so, so whether that's having an influence, I, I don't know. But unfortunately, as I say, there are just one or two who, who, who aren't participating. I saw a flurry of hands. The only additional point I'd add to that is that I think it's, it's important that this council acts reasonably in making those requests. And I think from the way in which you've outlined it, Matt, I certainly think that that approach is, is a reasonable one. Um, there were a flurry of hands, so apologies. I'll go Councillor Wells first, and if you want to speak, can you just make, it, make yourself aware? I was going to ask about the cost. The other issue is, if, if, we did, if um, some of these people that aren't engaging, if it's because they've left the industry and we then say that they're not fit and proper persons, what happens if they then decide to come back to the industry? Is that, is that something that's held against them? I think, um, Les, Leslie outlined earlier, that there is now a register of people that are not considered fit and proper persons, so it would, it would trigger on that, but um, I would obviously have the opportunity to explain their situation when they next put in an application. Just to add to what Matt's just said, one of the th requirements when you complete an application form for the grant of a, 
a driver's license is that you have to declare if you've, your license has been suspended or revoked by another authority or if you've had your application refused and if they have ticked that box we would look into that further to, to find out why. Councillor Boyce. The safety of the passengers has to be paramount um, and I think we are doing our best to ensure that safety checks are done and if drivers do not want to actually take part in that that says to me they're not really taking it very seriously and I think we have to actually do and just sort of say unless you're going to participate in this as all your colleagues are you cannot take you cannot be um, a driver anymore and I just can't see why we even worry about it really because it is so important um, that we um, ensure the safety of everybody. I saw some hands earlier around this area. Councillor Pelvich, are you indicating? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, a, a question for you, really. I, I know you've seen this um, audit report, um, and you did make some reference to it, I think, at the last committee meeting. Um, why has it not been attached as an annex so that we could, um, so that we could see and consider it? I think it's in as a link at the end of the paper. Um, Right. So it was certainly available online. I certainly take on, on board your point. You, you would like to see it as a physical annex, or, or I think that would have been. I think that would have been useful. Um, and the second question was um, the refresher checks um, that haven't been carried out routinely. What period of time? <coughs> excuse me. Are we talking about for them not having been? Undertaken is it a number of years, a number of months? Yeah, it is a number of years. Um, goes back. Um, well, we're still trying to process all the ones that haven't gone through. But yeah, looking at 2012, going back to 2000, it is a period of time. <coughs> so, just, just, just briefly. Uh, obviously, this was a, a recommendation from the Audit and Governance Committee that it was brought to this committee. And myself, and in discussion with Councillor Mason, as we were coming out of there, felt that potentially you know, we, we wanted to get this to the committee as early as possible so that everyone could, could have sight of that. Um, fully take on board the point about it maybe being attached in full um, to the paper. But yeah, the, the link was, was certainly in the annex. I'm, I'm just, and I'm sure this, was already dis this has already been discussed at <coughs> Audit and Governance, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around um, how six years worth of checks haven't happened, um, given the points that everybody's made, including yourself, about the importance of DBS and checks. And was there an expectation that the police would just inform you about when somebody um, was charged or um, being investigated. I, I, I'm really trying to understand how this has happened. Yes, I, I think you have to understand the context in which um, the uh, officers are operating. I mean, there's, there's, particularly in recent years, there's been an awful lot of pressure on the team through the out-of-town drivers, we've had the training, uh, the new training that's come in, and, and various other things. And, and it's one of those things that, um, has not been done and um, one of the um, illustrations of this is that there was a piece of work to try and pick this up last year but it um, it was it was a paper-based system and it was very very resource intensive and it didn't work and what we were able to do was to use the moment that that um, <coughs> the lessons from that process when we tried to pick it up to introduce this new system which is super efficient and which the, um, uh, as I say, the, the drivers <coughs> have engaged in. Um, so it, the, the reason why they haven't been done, it, it goes back year. I mean, it goes back before the existing <laughs> managers in the in the service um, were, were 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 in place. But there, there has been a tremendous amount, amount of pressure on officers. We've since since restructured the licensing team as well to try and. Um, 
filter out some of the peaks and troughs between the general licensing team who, do, who deal with the alcohol licenses and every other license that you have and the taxi licenses to try and smooth out the peaks and troughs so they can help each other out. So, so we, we think that will, that will help uh, prevent a problem in the future because they have been um, uh, feeling the strain with all the other demands. And then it, it's simply a management oversight that, that those checks haven't been done. Sure, if I could just come in, I yeah. just want to reassure committee that the management actions are in place from the directorate to, to make sure this doesn't happen uh, again. And as Matt says, it, uh, some of this goes back to times before some of the current managers were, were in post. It, it wasn't a, a criticism, I was just really trying to get a, a, a picture of, of, of how it's happened. Are we moving to the electronic um, version? I mean, I get my DBS done electronically. I, you have to pay £13 a year for it, but um, it then allows that DBS just to be updated electronically. <coughs> Hopefully, it's in the consultation. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that will be, that, that will be the, um, the, the best position, I think, for the city. Then officers can simply go on to the system and, and, and look, at, look at history. I mean, that would be the best position, I think, for us to be in, but the system, but don't get me wrong, the system we've got is is a, a vast improvement on the paper system, where there were bits of paper going up, being sent off to the DBS backwards and forwards. It's much better what we've got now, but that would be that would be preferable, I think. Councillor Reid. Yeah, it was just on how he actually did it. I, I only asked the question because. I've been DBS'd a couple of times once when I was a governor, which went through the council. I then was trying to find out how an organize, another organisation I'm involved with, where the people dealing with young people doing Duke of Edinburgh needed to be DBS'd, and it was a nightmare, because the council now doesn't do it generally for people. But presumably we have a system for taxi drivers, so they come and give us the money and we do it? Or don't you actually... No, we use uh, an external company. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that, right, that. yes. So, so, so the way it works is that the driver um, goes, on, goes online and fills in the um, details that they're required to submit. And then they need to bring in some of the proof of uh, identification documents into the council. And the council officers need to check those documents off yeah. uh, to make sure that... Um, they are, they are um, correct. That then is verified and goes off to DBS to be processed yeah. through, a, through a third company, yeah. uh, via a third company. And then the officers receive back a notification to say it's been done. Yeah. But the actual paperwork or, or the, the um, DBS itself goes back, to the office, uh, goes back to the driver. So the officers don't see it. So they need the driver then to bring along yeah. the DBS check yeah. so that the officers can see what's on it, and then we need to check if there are any convictions, those we know about, and those which are new. To clarify as well, we are a re the taxi licensing service are a registered body with the disclosure and barring service that allows us to do DBS checks and check the documentation that's required, because we we have to sign it off, so to speak, that we've seen those documentation. So ourselves as taxi licensing, we're a registered body, and so is the council's human resource team. They're a registered body to do the disclosure and barring yeah, service. Right. Uh, but if you're just a, um, a little organisation that only wants to do one person, it is a nightmare trying to find somebody that will... And I, the council just refused. Hatched it through North Yorkshire in the end. Anyway, um, but also I heard, is this right, that... Uh, because at one point you had to be DBS'd by different organisations separately, but we don't, is that true that you don't now, that it's one that covers everything? In which case, if somebody's being DBS'd because they're a scout leader, do they need to be DBS'd to be a taxi driver? Yes, you do. You, um, the, there's different headings that you, your DBS checked under. Right. Okay. And um, dependent on what you're going to give you an example, if you're DBS checked to deal with children, that you tick a box to say it's to deal with children. We can't accept that DBS check. 
because we have to have a DBS check that's done on somebody under other services. So we get absolutely everything. Whereas with regards to if you've just ticked the box to say it's in relation to children, they will look to see if there's any convictions relating to you in relation to children. Councillor Pavlovich. But the government brought in a system to say that if you moved jobs, you should be able to take your DBS with you. And <clears throat> I've, had, I've had all sorts of problems um, working for the probation service, um, doing agencies, and no two agencies will accept the same DBS, even though they brought the, even though they brought the system in to say that you should be able... It is different if, you, if you've marked down that um, you, you're working as a, as a teacher or um, you're working with children, but the DBS should be able to, to translate from one job to another, as long as it's within the time scale. Yeah. Advice from the DBS, you can't do that. We have to do them under other service and therefore we can only accept them if done under other service. I hear what you're saying. So, but if somebody has had a DBS and other, for some other reason under other service, can we accept them? If it is in, within the time frame that a DBS is classed as valid, which is six months, right. yes, we would accept right. it. Okay. Councillors, any further questions before we move on to discussion? That's fine. Moving on to discussion. Um, I suppose the, the, the point that I wish to make is, Councillor Pavlovich, yeah, absolutely right, asking very legitimate questions about how uh, we've, we've come to, to this point. Um, and and I've, I've certainly received the assurances from management that this is something that they acknowledge has been a, an issue and there have been failings in this area and that is being rectified. And that's particularly why, as the Gambling Licensing Regulatory Committee, I think we should have a monitoring role in seeing and ensuring that that is... Um, taken through to a conclusion and, and really for me it also highlights the, the value of audit in terms of bringing out issues that might have been bubbling under the, under the surface, raising that to, to the appropriate profile and then ensuring that resources put in to make sure that, that that's put right. Um, does anyone else wish to, to make a comment, Councillor Pavlovich? I absolutely, um, I absolutely agree with you, Chair. Um, I, I, I think it does um, supply um, a, a, a really important process. I don't think the authority are unusual in where it's been. I've worked in a number of organisations where DBS refreshers haven't, haven't taken place within the time scale. Um, it is something that's, that's incredibly important and I would uh, agree with your recommendation that um, we get regular updates as to um, as to where where we are um, with with the checks and so I would absolutely support that if you wanted to add that to the recommendations yeah I, I certainly will I mean one of the comments I made at audit and governance was that it reminded me of as of my time as executive member for housing and safe neighborhoods following the the Grenfell fire when all the councils across the land were rushing to to check their own uh, fire safety records and lo and behold we were significantly behind in, in doing a lot of those fire safety checks and that was an issue that probably there wasn't that level of awareness um, uh, higher up as well so certainly you know parallels can, can be drawn there. I think there's there's two things that as a committee we need to, to comment on. First of all in terms of those monitoring reports I, I would suggest six monthly or quarterly I, either I'd be relatively happy with and the second uh, would be to make a, a wider comment with regard to the point that, that Matt was making earlier, I know some councillors commented on, about how licensees or, or holders of licences should be dealt with if they do not cooperate with the, the DBS checks that we're, we're pushing through at the moment to, to bring ourselves up to that point where we are up to date. I, I fully endorse the, the approach that's being taken and, and the comments that, that Matt has made, and it sounds like there's a lot of agreement around the table that if we do get to a point where there are a very small number of drivers that are refusing uh, to, to provide us with a, a DBS check, in my view, that certainly doesn't make them a fit and proper person to hold a taxi licence. So from that point of view, I, I'd fully endorse the approach that, that Matt and, and the team are, are taking. Uh, Councillor Reid. 
I, would, I agree with what you've said. I'd, what I, I would suggest that we add a report in three months because given that between the writing of this report and today, the number of the percentage on paragraph 16, the percentage has gone up from 51% to 70%. If we had a report in three months, hopefully it will be near 100 by then. Um, and then after that, it could be six monthly. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And I think the, the importance is that we, we understand when it's been completed and then that there yeah. are occasional checks to yes. ensure that, that yeah. That's, yeah. that's followed through. So yeah. um, perhaps if that could be added on in, in terms of option two to make alternative recommendations, accepting all of those in option one with the addition of an update in three months' time whenever, whenever that next meeting of, of this committee oh. is and then six monthly after that, if that's what this committee decides, depending on what that outcome is, Councillor Pavlovich. To go back to the, um, the fit and proper persons um, question, I, I, I agree. I, I, I don't feel that as a, uh, as a committee um, and as an authority, we can um, accept that some people are refusing to undertake it and still expect to keep um, to keep their license. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it it, it drives a, a coach and horses, coach and horse drawn carriage, <laughs> um, through the uh, th through the point of having um, a policy and regulations. So I would absolutely support that those individuals within a, a reasonable time frame, and I think you've um, outlined what that reasonable time frame should be, um, should be declared as, as as not fit and proper persons. And if they then reapply for a, a license, they need to explain why they chose not to em engage with the process. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Therefore, I'll, I'll move option two with the, the comments that we've made before. Is that, is that clear? Yep. Happy with that, everyone? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have any urgent business, and therefore declare the meeting closed. Thank you much, everyone. Thanks.